Welcome to another lecture by Medical Medics Learning Made Easy, Anatomy Chapter 11, The Integumentary System. In this lecture, we will cover functions, structures of the skin, the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Talk about accessory structures, the process of thermoregulation, some skin disorders, common diagnostic tools, and end with a summary. Now, what are the functions of the integumentary system? First of all, it's involvement in protection. So it is a barrier against pathogens, UV radiation, and injury. Furthermore, we have thermoregulation, which regulates body temperature via sweat and blood flow. Sensation. We detect touch, temperature, pain, and pressure changes. Excretion. Removing waste through sweat. We have vitamin D synthesis, so it converts cholesterol into vitamin D with UV exposure. So our skin plays a very vital role. Now let's look at the structure of skin. We have three main layers. We have the epidermis, which is the outermost layer, protecting us against environmental damage. Seen here. This part. We then have the dermis, which is the middle layer containing our blood vessels, nerves, glands, and connective tissue. Illustrated here. We have the hypodermis, or the subcutaneous layer. It is the deepest layer, which stores fat and provides insulation. Seen here. And some anatomy structures we have here hair sticking out we have the stored fat down here in the hypodermis slightly above it with beginning with our uh, our dermis we will find arteries veins hair follicles sweat gland and we also find nerves the corpuscule sweat glands, etc. So let's begin our journey by diving first into the epidermis. Now its composition, stratified squamous epithelium. So the epidermis is made of multiple layers of flat cells designed to protect the body from environmental damage. We find cells here, so keratinocytes, the primary cells, Okay, it's the primary cells that produce keratin, which is a protein that strengthens the skin and makes it water resistant. Then we have the melanocytes. So these are cells in the stratum basal. All right, in the uh, stratum basal. And these produce melanin. So that's the pigment responsible. It gives us the pigment responsible for our skin color and for UV protection. Then we have the Langerhans cells. These are immune cells that help protect the skin by detecting and responding to pathogens. And then we have Merkel cells. These are sensory cells in the stratum basal that detect touch and relay signals to nerves. Now let's look a bit deeper into the different layers here. So from deepest to the most superficial. So again, starting with the stratum basal. It's the bottom layer where cell division occurs. Okay. Also where melanin, uh, melano melanocytes actually, Melanocytes are producing and generating melanin. So that's happening in the stratum basal. Then we have the stratum spinosum. It's a layer of cells with spiny connections, providing skin strength and flexibility. Then we have the stratum granulosum. So cells begin to die here and produce keratin hyalin granules, which is critical for keratin formation. 
Then we have the stratum lucidum, a clear, it's a clear and thin layer found only in thick scale, uh, skin, like our palms or soles, etc. And it's for added protection. Then we have the stratum corneum. It's the outermost layer of dead, keratinized cells that form a tough, protective barrier. And this structure ensures um, skin provides physical protection, immune defense, and sensory input, etc. Now let's continue to the dermis. So its composition is connective tissue with collagen and elastin fibers. It contains our blood vessels and nerves, sweat and sebaceous or oil glands, hair follicles and sensory receptors. It has two layers, so it has the papillary layer, which is thin, superficial, and forms fingerprints. And it has the reticular layer, which is dense, provides strength and elasticity. And now then the hypodermis. It is composed of adipose and connective tissue. Functions storing fat for energy and insulation. It cushions and protects underlying organs. And it anchors skin to muscles and bones. Now let's talk about some accessory structures. So hair protects against UV radiation and foreign particles. It is composed of keratin. It grows from hair follicles in the dermis, which was the middle layer. What about our nails? These protect tips of fingers and toes. It is composed of hardened keratin. Then we have the glands, sweat glands. These can be divided to apocrine and eccrine. Now, these regulate body temperature, and the apocrine ones are found in armpits and groin, activated during stress. Then we have the sebaceous glands. These secrete sebum to lubricate and protect our skin. Now, let's talk about another function, which is thermoregulation. Now, to get heat loss, we have sweat evaporation, which cools the body by absorbing heat as sweat transitions from liquid to vapor. Another way is dilation of blood vessels near the skin surface, which increases heat dissipation by enhancing blood flow to the skin. Now, in opposite to heat loss, if we want to re do heat retention, uh, we have constriction of blood vessels, so instead of vasodilation here, we have vasoconstriction here, which reduces heat loss by limiting blood flow to the skin. And then we have subcutaneous fat, which provides insulation, minimizing heat transfer to the environment. Now, when we talk about thermoregulation, it's unavoidable to talk about the central thermoreceptors and the peripheral thermoreceptors. And essentially, what we're talking about is the role of the hypothalamus in thermoregulation. So the central thermoreceptors located in the hypothalamus and other brain regions monitor the body's core temperature by detecting changes in the temperature of blood. And peripheral thermoreceptors found in the skin detect external temperature changes and send signals to the brain through our sensory nerves. So once these signals come to our hypothalamus, it then acts as, the, as a body thermostat, integrating signals from both central and peripheral input and triggering responses like sweating or shivering or vasodilation or constriction, all in the, to maintain homeostasis and to regulate the body temperature within a very narrow and healthy range. A great example of your thermoregulation and your hypothalamus at work in pathology is, for example, during a fever. 
So why does fever develop? Why does shivering develop? Well, during, an, let's say you have an infection, all right? Some mm, pathogen uh, and uh, the pyrogens, so the fever-inducing substances uh, in, within your inflammatory uh, response system, signal the hypothalamus to raise the body's temperature. We have been invaded by something that should not be here. So in the process, signals are sent to your hypo hypothalamus to raise the body's temperature uh, set point, the set point of your temperature, to help fight off these pathogens. Okay? So what happens is that there is a perception of cold. So the body interprets the current temperature as being too low compared to the new set point. Remember, something has invaded our body. Signals has gone to your central nervous system, your hypothalamus. You need to elevate the set point for uh, our body right now. Now, when that has happened, let's say it jumps to 38 degrees, the new set point, and we are at 37. Now, the body does something then to increase 37 to 38 because this is too cold or too low compared to the new set point. Now, how does it do that? Through, for example, shivering. So the body generates heat through muscle contractions. This is shivering. And this is happening to raise the temperature to this new set point. Because for whatever calculation your body has made, or your hypothalamus, at 38 we could possibly kill off whatever problem or uh, issue we have. But once this set point is made, it's not enough. Now this has to go back to your body and through some process, get it to reach that level. It needs to create an elevation of temperature. And it does that through the process of shivering, meaning muscle contractions. So what happened then? Once the... Uh, fever, let's say we reach 38 and this problem is now finished. Now we want to break this fever and go down. We want to change and return to another set point. So there is a res res uh, reset to this set point. Because the infection now, for whatever reason, say it's controlled. So the hypothalamus lowers the set point back to normal. Now when the opposite then has happened, right? So before we elevated it to 38, or let's say to make it easier, let's say to 40. And 37 compared to 40 is quite cold. So we get shivering to reach this new number. Now we're done and we want to do the reverse. So the body sets the new temperature at 37. So how do we then get from 40 back to 37? This is where we have the uh, perception of heat now instead of the perception of cold. So the body now recognizes that, oh, this elevated temperature that I have is too high because my new set point is actually back to 37. So what happens is sweating and vasodilation. And these are cooling mechanisms that activate to dissipate excess heat and return the body to its normal temperature. So in summary then, shivering and sweating during a fever are part of the body's thermoregulation. But, and this is an important but because a lot of students make this mistake, these are not always aimed at cooling the body. Initially, the goal is to raise the body's temperature to the new fever set point. But later, it is to cool the body when the fever resolves. Hope that made it more clear. Now let's just briefly mention some skin disorders. So we have acne, for example, the inflammation of our sebaceous glands. We have eczema, which is a chronic inflammation causing itchy red skin. Psoriasis, an autoimmune condition leading to rapid skin cell turnover. We can, of course, have skin cancer, so basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, etc. We can have burns, right? And we categorize burns into first, second, and third degree. 
Uh, you can just get a overview here. We have lectures going into detail on each of these. So some common diagnostic tools used, and we have biopsy, analyzing skin tissue samples for abnormalities. Dermatoscopy, where we are examining skin lesions and moles. Patch testing, identifying allergens causing skin reactions. And of course, imaging, so high-resolution imaging for deeper skin analysis. So in summary then, the integumentary system protects the body and maintains homeostasis. It is composed of skin, hair, nails, and glands, and it performs multiple essential functions. Understanding skin layers and disorders aids in the effective diagnosis and treatment. So from this lecture, if you can focus on the anatomy, you will have picked up epidermis, the dermis, the hypodermis. We've talked about some structures involved in thermoregulation, the accessory structures like skin, uh, hair, our nails, etc. And we had a lot of uh, subparts in relation to the different skin layers and the functions of each layers and what you find there. Strongly recommend going back and repeating um, and focusing on the different anatomic regions. That's the end of this lecture. Continue now to chapter 12.